consider to come to the front because we don't have a mic. Yeah, there is a mic, but only for one of us. Yeah. <laughs> Just come, come. We have cookies. Not, but come. It's more exciting than the first row. The action is here. We won't spin. So, okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Welcome <laughs> to EclipseCon Europe 2015. But the rooms are big and the bandwidth is small. <laughs> <laughs> so in this talk, we're going to share our experiences on making the X-Text contribution process pa more painless for people from the outside. So our assumption is, since you're here, that you have some open source project. You wrote some really cool piece of code that you got out there into the world. And you're one of the lucky ones. People are using it. And so now you want those people to contribute back. Who is in that situation? <laughs> Come on, guys. Good. You're right. But everyone else is welcome, too. <laughs> so the mission, of course, is for an open source project to get as many people as possible to contribute back. You want bug reports. You want uh, pull requests for your project. You want new features that others implement. You don't want to do all the work yourself, basically. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, there are a few obstacles. First of all, I'm using your project. So I'm in Eclipse, and I'm using, let's say, EMF, because everybody knows it. And now I want to know, OK, I've, I think I found a bug. Uh, I want to work on that project. I want to find out what went wrong. So first of all, I need to find the project. Where's the source code? Secondly, how do I compile this? And then, once I've done my change, how do I know if it's even technically correct? So how do I run the tests? Once I'm kind of confident that I want to submit this, oh, how do I get it to the committers? How do I get it into review? And then, of course, probably committers will not just accept it as it is. They will have some review, and there will be some back and forth between us. And if I'm lucky and everything goes well, in the end, I will have my change accepted. So, this whole process must be very painless, otherwise you will just lose all your potential contributors. So let's try contributing to EMF, shall we? I know that's an Eclipse project, so I've got that covered. Uh, I have eclipse.org here. At, at some point, I figure out that it's somewhere at more, and then how to contribute, and then read this bunch of stuff, and then there's this little link. And there are the source code repositories. And then good luck finding the correct one. There's a search, so OK. Let's go to EMF. And now I'm greeted by this very helpful online browser. <laughs> Who knows where I'll find the e-object class here? You know. Oh, OK. Go, go. <laughs> yeah. You're too good. You know all this already. <laughs> So I go to the tree, and then what? <laughs> I, I search for e-object. No. No, I just get commits about e-objects, which is fine, but that's not really what I was looking for. OK, so I, I failed at step one. That's a pretty bad track record for any project. <laughs> I failed at the step finding the source code and checking it out. Uh, yeah, not so great. So this is basically. Uh, where we with Xtext also were. Uh, and the contribution process, once you kind of figured out through probably asking the committers how to set this thing up, the next step was contributing your change back. And well, not so many years ago, it used to be you send a patch file. Yeah, that's what you did. You really send a patch file, and then the committers had to apply that themselves and then see if it works, uh, because no build server was there to tell them. Um, Later, it got a little better. Uh, everyone moved to Git and now using Garrett for code review. But still, who, who understood Garrett out of the box? Just raise your hands. One guy? You're a genius, mister. <laughs> I want your signature later. So Garrett is not quite straightforward. Even if you are a, let's say, amateur Git user, 
uh, you really need to know how Garrett works. You need to know about this thing called the change ID. You need to know that you cannot just send another commit to your change set. No, you need to amend or in, if you screwed up, you need to do an interactive rebase. This all sounds pretty scary. So people tend to get lost at this point. So what we at uh, Xtex did instead is migrate somewhere where it's a little bit nicer. Exactly. A little bit nicer is like tremendously nicer. <laughs> People nowadays tend to go to GitHub if they want to find source code for open source projects. The Eclipse Foundation figured that out as well. So since a few months or maybe years, all the Eclipse source code is mirrored at GitHub. It is nice, you can go there and find the sources and have a read only copy of the real thing. That's where we were, like 12 months ago. And we figured, well, being on GitHub is already nice, but it's still not yet the real thing. We wanted GitHub to be the primary artifact for our sources, and lucky enough, that is already possible at the Eclipse Foundation. So what we did, we moved all our development activities from the Eclipse.org Git service to GitHub, which implies that we also changed the way how people contribute back to Xtest. Just by this minor thing, so to say. I'm just raising the volume. <laughs> if I'm not loud enough, please raise your hand and complain. You're louder than Thank you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Contribution process. At GitHub, it's a very well-known process. You usually have pull requests, so you go to GitHub and say, I want to fork that project. You get your own copy, your own repository with all the sources inside. Then you commit to your own thing, and then you can hit one button, and it will be uh, like a pull request so-called pull request on the real source code repository. And that is where we wanted to be. We wanted to adapt to this well-known process of contributing back to open source projects. And that was possible by this move. Um, it has a couple of other advantages on GitHub as well. For example, in the user interface that you saw for the Eclipse Git repositories, that was like a little bit scary at a first glance, and at a second, Third as well. At GitHub, it's even possible to edit source code online. So if you have only a minor documentation change, there's even no need to copy all the gigabytes of source code, literally gigabytes of source code, to your local machine just to fix that and create a pull request. So that was immediately enabled just by the move to GitHub. Of course, it's all not it, it's not everything shiny and, and wonderful at GitHub. So for example, the Garrett review process for us as a uh, committer on the project was kind of, well, it was different, kind of better and kind of worse at the same time. Um, the diff view on GitHub is awkwardly slow when it comes to very big change sets. It's really nice for slow one, uh, slow for small change sets, but a little bit cumbersome for bigger changes. And for very big commits, which we sometimes see, um, well, it, it's just choking so badly that you need to check out the change set locally. But in that case, for these big things, it's often a good idea anyway to review the code locally. So what did we get with this pull request workflow is... Um, one more. Is this nice? view that we even use um, internally when we develop. So everything is now done with the same process as contributors would use. So we have here a change request uh, by Stefan with a lot of discussion going on. And the advantage is that we do not only discuss with other committers, but even with the build server. So we have a very nice integration between a continuous integration system on Jenkins and the GitHub pull requests. So I can now talk to Jenkins and say, please test this crap. Yeah. I constantly change stuff and break it, so. Yeah, that's what he does. I can understand. I forgive you. So if I say Jenkins test, um, a job will be scheduled on our build server. 
Um, if a committer pushes something to GitHub, it will be done transparently. So there's no need to go there and do this manually. It will happen automatically for uh, not committers. So for contributors, which will, there is in theory the potential of checking in harmful code. That's why we don't do it for contributors automatically as well. So for those, we, we have a manual review process. So now we scheduled this job. And <laughs> well, that's the right resolution for this page. <laughs> um, that is our Jenkins, only for the master branch. So we have like 40 different configurations with different test suites that could be run. So depending on the kind of change, we can even trigger different uh, jobs to be executed on the build server to figure out whether the pull request was valid and um, meets our quality criteria or whether it will break things. So that is an advantage that wasn't, this wasn't possible with Garrett as, at all because Garrett will always just build with one configuration independently from the real change set. Oh, that's uh, by the Eclipse Foundation. There, so, yeah. That's fully automated? Yeah. There was a question about the uh, different checks that were. Um, I'll show it. Yeah. There were different checks going on automatically. One of that is the IP validation. So, um, if you're already a committer at Eclipse, this IP validation will happen automatically. Otherwise, it will mention that the contributor is not yet a committer and that the committer itself needs to check for valid um, intellectual property before the code is merged into the repository. So that is also automated now. And you get this alert when there is something to do for you as a committer. By the way, if there are any questions, please just yell at us. We will try to answer them. Uh, could you go back to the slides, sure. please? So that was our first step towards easier contribution processes. Um, another one, another step was um, now that, well, the code is accessible, way um, good luck with building X text. <laughs> uh, it's like six million lines of code in various projects, different configurations that need to be um, performed before you even come remotely close to a green workspace with the X text repository. Um, that's why we figured 10 months ago that it's worthwhile to describe the process. Um, which is this one. So we wrote a contributor guide. It's like, uh, who of you was in the oomph talk? Oh, only a few of you, so I can do the joke again. <laughs> um, Literally, we had this um, six, basically, chapters or sections about how to contribute to XTEX and how to build it locally. So you started with some user account stuff that you need to create, okay. Then you need to install Eclipse, okay. Um, I can handle that. And then comes the really creepy part, setting up the development environment. So you run an ANT script, first build technology, to download Buckminster and install it and run it second build technology. Buckminster is great, by the way. It performs the build exactly as it is done in Eclipse. Who of you knows Buckminster? Well, that's also the problem of Buckminster. Nobody knows it. Who of you knows Maven? Yay! Everyone knows Maven. No one knows Buckminster. Doesn't tell us anything about the maturity of the tool, but Buckminster has some image problem. Um, so you run this ARM script, it will install Buckminster, it will perform a lot of things. You need the uh, wget and what else, and some working setup, uh, working set setup, and pushing to review server configuration, etc., etc., etc. That was the state of the art. So you start that, it will perform some download, you get distracted, will read something on the internet, grab a coffee, forget that you wanted to contribute, etc., etc., etc. Really bad experience. That was December 2014. It's way better now. Present. We migrated to Oomph. Oomph allows to automate all the things. 
Actually, you don't even need to know where to find the sources, but that's another story because hopefully we can discover that for you. So it's, uh, as it says on the slide, it's a completely automated process. Every single step that had to be performed manually before is now automated and transparently executed for you. All the settings that you could not even set automatically before are now applied to your Eclipse installation. That includes all things like encoding settings, line feeds, working set configuration, where to push, where to pull from with Git, everything, so to say. Um, the fun fact about OOMF is that it also updates your Eclipse installation. So on our daily development, we are always on the head of Xtext. Uh, so I don't only have the sources in my workspace, but also have the daily thing installed. Which means that sometimes things break. That could either be a broken master branch on Xtext itself, or it could be that OOMF updated itself from the latest and break or oomph itself is broken. Anyway, um, that coined the term bad oomph day. So the unlucky person who arrived at first in the office and performed an oomph setup was constantly asked, is it safe to oomph? Most of the time it is, except if you have a Mac, then you're, or well, it's still most of the time safe to oomph. But anyway, it may happen that you screw up your installation. That's the downside, but I would say the advantages uh, are overwhelming compared to what we had before. And I can only recommend it, not even for uh, open source project, but also if you have a rather complex setup in your company and want to uh, onboard new employees or whatever, having an OOF setup available that will install all the things is really very convenient. And here we see how it looks like on uh, a Windows machine. So we install the newest Eclipse when we oomph. Uh, then we configure something like uh, max memory settings, um, set some preferences that we want to have, import the project. So if a new project uh, is created in Xtext, in the Xtext source code repository, it will automatically be imported. And then we perform some um, dependency downloads and uh, configure the working sets on each machine. Everything's done with a single click, so to say. So very, very convenient. Can only recommend that. Uh, next up was documentation. Documentation is something that people like to contribute to because it's really easy. You read it and you figure there's a typo or this is crap that is written there or outdated or the screenshot is blurry or whatever. And you want to contribute back. In earlier days, we had to check out everything um, and somehow figure out how to set up a local running web server and Apache and PHP and whatever was necessary. Um, we figured that is a bad experience, not only for contributors, but also for us as committers. That's why we migrated everything to Markdown, um, which is a little bit more convenient than HTML itself. Um, it's also quite easy to edit Markdown online because well, there are web editors for Markdown available. And with Jekyll, we can even have a local preview of the thing. I want to demo that. How it looks like when we, change, when we do real big changes on the documentation. So we do Jekyll surf. And it will uh, create a, a web server or in, started. And now I can go to this one, and it's there. And this is now the Xtex web page served from my local machine. And if I want to edit something, I can just go here and say, well, um, language development made easy. I would have three exclamation marks, because I like that better. And if I go back to the page, it tries to go to the real server. So now we have language development made easy somewhere. Button of localhost. Yeah, waiting wait for localhost is interesting. <coughs> anyway, you can believe me. <laughs> Very convincing demo. Apparently, I didn't figure out where I did the edit. Oh, you know what? No, it's a Windows machine, so of course the command line is crappy. 
What happened? It just got stuck. You know PowerShell. It's a, ah. great, it's a really great tool. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, hey, exclamation mark. So, <laughs> back to the slides. Um, so advantages now that you can uh, edit the documentation quite straightforward. If you do bigger changes, you run the local uh, the page locally and can uh, double check that the layout is not broken. Uh, simple things can be added online, directly on GitHub. There are a few drawbacks. All oh, it's markdown. That it's, uh, the, set, the syntax set is quite fixed. If you want to do more tricky things like references to uh, some source code that you have in the repository that's automatically validated or whatever, then you have to do some scripting, but it still works. Um, and well, on, on some boxes it may be a little bit difficult to set up Jekyll, but that's not well, the mainly on my box. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> So yeah, um, setting up Jekyll on Windows is a little more painful yeah. because it uses native bundles and the Ruby community doesn't really care about Windows users. But you want to I got it working. Yep. So not just, we didn't just uh, streamline uh, the development of our Eclipse plugins or the documentation. Um, we also had a few new challenges. You know, back in the day, Xtext was just Eclipse plugins. So all you needed was Eclipse, and then you used PDE to build the project, or headlessly you could use Buckminster, or maybe Maven Taiko if you're so inclined. So that was relatively straightforward. But now with 2.9, we want to support web-based editing with x -Tex. We want to support, I dare say it, IntelliJ. So don't, don't tell anyone, okay? Don't tell the directors. Uh, and now try building an IntelliJ plugin with Eclipse PDE. It explodes. There's a hidden switch. OK, so we needed some build tool to hide all this complexity. There's dependencies coming from B2. There's dependencies coming from Maven Central. There's dependencies coming from the IntelliJ repositories. Uh, there's all kinds of different build technologies involved. And that all needs a streamlined release process and a streamlined build process. And the user needs a streamlined interface. If, if he checks out a repository, he needs to know, OK, now how do I build this? And that is why we use Gradle. Um, with Gradle, we could create a really nice top-level build that just hides all this complexity behind some simple tasks. So uh, Gradle is, is nice in that regard that it can describe itself. It knows about the model of your build, so all the tasks and their dependencies. So if I just say Gradle tasks, it will tell me, hey, there is something that is called install, which installs the project into your local Maven repo. And there is something called run idea, which launches IntelliJ idea with all our cool plugins that we have developed. Or there's a, a, a task called release that publishes all the things from our repository to Maven Central and all the other repositories. And that makes it very easy for users to use it, for ourselves, of course, to use it, for the build server to consume it. And we can hide all this heterogeneity. Of course, this power comes with a downside. Uh, you can shoot yourself in the foot more easily if you're so unconstrained. So if you don't constantly refactor your build logic like you do with your production code, then it can quickly become a tangled, non-understandable mess. So you really need to treat your build scripts as first-class citizens and don't just copy-paste all over the place like you do with your Maven poems. Um, and the second thing is, there's not much in terms of auto-completion in the build scripts as of now. The Gradle guys are aware of this. They want to improve it in the future. But right now in Eclipse, you get pretty much nothing. And in IntelliJ, you get some kind of rudimentary proposals in build scripts, but nothing that will really help you. So mostly you read the documentation to find out how you can do something, how do you, you can reconfigure something in your build. So I guess you can't read that anyway, but <laughs> this is just a snippet that just is showing uh, how declarative the build looks like in the end. So we just say, OK, we have this web project, and we support different front ends. We support Eclipse Orion. We support Ace. We support Code Mirror. And for each of those, we need to create minified JavaScript, minified CSS, and so on. So we can just uh, do a little coding and say, OK, for each of these three, create these three tasks, JavaScript, minified JavaScript, CSS. 
Yeah? Try that with Maven. With Maven, you would just be copy-pasting the same stuff over and over, or with Ant, same thing. You would just be copy-pasting all that. So with Gradle, you can just write some groovy code and be done with it. Another thing which uh, goes in the same direction, you saw all our build jobs. There's like 50 of them, and they have mostly the same configuration. They have the same JD JDK, they have the same target platform, they have roughly the same build logic, except for that one piece where it says, okay, now run these tests. Now build that project, and not this one. Yeah? That's the only difference inside. And, well, back in the day, they were all manually configured, so you can imagine no job was like the other. No one knew why one job failed and the other didn't, or, well, if it would work at all, and why it worked, and what was the correct configuration, and what was an error, and who did it, and so on. Um, and so often there would be changes that we should do, like we should raise the lower boundary of our target platform, but we just didn't want to because it was such a hassle. Um, and this is where we said, okay, stop. <laughs> we need to consolidate this. So we took all the jobs, compared all the config XMLs, and we found the one true configuration that we put into a template file. And then we just use a bit of groovy code in the Gradle build file to say, okay, now take this template and just expand it 40 times with this JDK, with that JDK, with this target platform, with that target platform, and for all our five, six different test configurations. And that gives you all those jobs. And it's just one command. You just say, Gradle, update Jenkins items, and all your jobs are uh, updated. This also means if something completely horrible happens to our Jenkins installation, and our admin is not, uh, is not capable of restoring it, we can say, hey, no problem. Just give us a fresh Jenkins, and we say, Jenkins, update Jenkins items. Uh, Gradle update Jenkins items, and all our jobs are back. So, and also, it's under version control. So now I know who did this change uh, and why he did it. Hopefully, he added a commit message. <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and also, <laughs> uh, also, if anybody does manual changes, uh, I can just say no. I just say update Jenkins items and get all that manual stuff out there again. I want my jobs to be clean. So everything now goes through one point of truth. Yeah? Have you also considered using one of these cloud services in that area, like Travis or Circle CE? Um, like yeah, uh, we, like, we have considered Travis for a moment. So yeah, so have we considered something like Travis CI, for instance? Um, Travis is a little limiting because, at least for open source projects, there is one concurrent build uh, per project, and we need like 10 to work properly. Um, and also, Travis doesn't give you any history except for the command line output, and we need uh, test reports and find box reports and so on and so forth. So our admins provide us with a Jenkins server, so we're happily using that. Yeah. But you're using your own infrastructure, right? This is not Eclipse. This, this Jenkins is our own infrastructure, yeah. Um, yeah we, because we, like, have, we have test suites that, that run like 10 hours and it would be a little bit harmful for the overall Eclipse infrastructure to like serve us yeah. that much <laughs> computational power. And well, also we have full control over what our Jenkins does, which is probably also possible in Eclipse, but it would be cumbersome. It's, it's a little harder because you need to bother the Eclipse admins and yep. instead of just telling your admin, hey, just install this, please. Yep. Do it. <laughs> uh, of course, there is a little downside to this. Um, you no longer use the Jenkins UI. You use a text file. So what you usually do is you go into the UI, you pick one of the many jobs as an example, do your change, like let's add the Findbox plugin to the job, and then you go into the config XML, copy that snippet out that you just created by doing the GUI configuration, and then pasting that into the template, and then say, great, we'll update Jenkins items, and then it uh, distributes that change over all our jobs. That's the workflow now. All right, so the reward. What did we get out of all this? It so, took us quite some time. Yeah, we constantly worked on, on that process since 18 months now, and it helped. <laughs> really, it, it, it 
it's not making our only it's not only making our life as committers easier that we also well we get contributions <laughs> which is which is great um, one of the main contributors that we have which is not yet, who's not yet a committer is Lorenzo sitting here in front in the first row um, so y you see, as soon as you have your setup once, then it's quite easy to keep on track and continue contributing things. So that's why it's uh, a great improvement with the setup that we now have. And we also get um, contributors that are first timers uh, with really fruitful discussions about deep internals of x -Tex, which is really nice. And the most important advantage is, as Stefan put it during the rehearsals, is that we use the same process as our contributors do for our own code and it's really fun to do that. So we also use the pull request workflow to figure out what kind of fix is important and how we should well, keep the quality of the code base uh, as it is. Of course there's more beyond code, there's marketing, there's websites, there's release cycles, Sometimes it's a good idea to not release even though you announced it for the very same day. Well, time boxing is not always the best thing for your users. So we dare to postpone releases from time to time. Things like that happen just to make the overall appearance of the XX framework and the overall quality as good or yeah, as yeah. good as it needs to be, so to say. Also, on the other hand, we release more often uh, than And the rest we release of more often. Well, there's couple of good releases and great releases per year now rather than only one big bang in July <laughs> which breaks everyone. So, um, so much about the contribution process to the XX framework. We have time for a couple of questions if you have any. Yes, please. And a big advantage is that you can revert a whole pull request. So if there is a feature branch that was merged and you find out, oh no, this, this was horrible, uh, you can just back it out completely, which is impossible if you linearized your history. So there's advantages. So, so we were told to stop, but we'll be around. And yeah. please ask us questions.